Look, I've seen every Fast and Furious movie, and I'm gonna be straight up with you. In the 10 that they've made so far, there are only three of them, maybe four, that are worth watching. And yet, after almost a decade passing since the last Fast and Furious movie that I enjoyed, which I'll talk about later, I'm still there for each and every release of a new installment, hoping that it'll reach the highs that it had. Welcome to Sandwich Reviews. I'm the Talking Sentient Sandwich, and how did we go from the Fast and Furious being a joke, to being a blockbuster franchise that's in on it, then going back to being the joke? How does that happen? Before I get into any of the movies, and I will, so if you haven't seen them, spoiler alert, I want to talk about how I got into this franchise, because I had no interest in watching any of the Fast and Furious movies. Nothing was drawing me to them. I mean, I'm not a car guy. I think car guys are the male equivalent of a horse girl, but around 2014, I learned that the franchise had taken a turn and become much more ridiculous in their action, dialogue, and their stunts, and I had to see it. If you haven't seen much of my channel, you probably wouldn't know, but I love superheroes. And it was the specific piece of information that in the sixth Fast and Furious movie, the crew fought evil versions of themselves that piqued my interest. So I watched each and every one, and at first, they weren't very good. But I stuck through, and man, am I glad I did. Five, six, and seven, you golden children, I hope you stay up in the light where everyone can see you. But let's go back to the beginning, to 2001's The Fast and Furious. For what was essentially a Point Break remake, no one working on it had any sights on making it into a franchise. Based on a magazine article by Ken Lee named Racer X, which sounds like it's from the future, but wow, that's a way better name. But anyway, the story was simple. A little played out, but simple. The sequel doesn't even feature Vin Diesel, and it's probably the worst in the franchise, which makes me completely puzzled as to why it was able to continue on, but maybe that's because the next movie is Tokyo Drift. Now, Tokyo Drift isn't a good movie by any stretch, but for some reason, I love it. It follows a traditional and cliched sports movie storyline, however, I'm always down for a story about someone being bad at a thing and throughout the runtime becoming really good at it. What can I say? I love a training montage. If you hadn't already caught on to this, Tokyo Drift is the elusive fourth good Fast and Furious movie that I mentioned before. It's also a lot more important than it would seem, or even for what was originally planned by the filmmakers, but we'll get back to that, because the next movie is where they brought everyone back together. The idea of the crew, of family, was born in this installment. Yet, this movie is not fun in any way. It tries to be a serious drama backed up with dynamic characters having to constantly make life-threatening decisions. But those characters and decisions were just never there. The filmmakers assembled an ensemble cast of memorable characters from the few movies that they had already made, and put together some entertaining action, but something was still off. In the next movie, the same kind of self-serious tone is carried on, but a hint of humor was added. It wasn't all too self-serious. Also, The Rock joined the cast, and his overacting was surprisingly welcome, building onto a campy style that only made the viewing experience that much more fun. It really starts in 5, where they're punching granite off of the walls, but they're not regular people. These guys are superheroes. But in this movie, and some of them moving forward, that works because it's fun. The characters are never in danger, but when the plot demands it, some side characters do get hurt. It's also a fun heist clearly inspired by Ocean's Eleven, but that's not what I remember from Five. That would be the safe drag. There's a lot of really cool stunts in this very movie, but the final crazy stunt is so well done, it blows my mind every time I see it. Because for those not aware, when you watch that safe fly down the road, that's real. CG is added on top to hide what's inside and to give flair, but what's inside is someone driving it. They built a safe over a truck to make a functional vehicle that could drive fast enough for filming. It was dangerous, and there are still some shots in the movie with a fully CG safe, but that effort went a long way into cementing 5 as a certifiably fun time. And as I mentioned before, the 6th is the one where they fight their evil doppelganger team. As if it were featuring the Star Trek Mirrorverse, each and every member of the crew has a counterpart that they have to face. And just to spice it up with some tropes, there's a little soap opera amnesia drama sprinkled in. 
But in the post credit scene, because there are post credit scenes in these movies, it's revealed that Tokyo Drift takes place after this movie. And later on, we see that it's actually during the 7th. Why does everyone look like they're from the early 2000s and have flip phones in Tokyo Drift? Don't question it. It doesn't matter. But despite that break in continuity that took me out of the movie, the seventh is somehow a beautiful tribute to Paul Walker after his tragic passing during its filming. There's some spotty CG and obvious camera work showing only the back of his head, but it works when you consider that it's all to honor what he would have wanted. From then on, in my opinion, it's all downhill, though there are some bright spots here and there. In 8, Vin Diesel turns evil, which was either a ripoff of when Optimus Prime did it in the Michael Bay Transformers franchise, or just parallel thought. But either way, it's done better, because Optimus only turned evil for like 5 minutes in that movie. Yet, it was in 8 that the cracks started to show of how unsustainable a franchise like this is, because the characters are now invincible. Pinning that thought on the board and just leaving it for now. Nine is where Vin Diesel is revealed to have a secret brother, and it's... John Ten is where Jason Momoa chews up some scenery, and it leads to a terrible cliffhanger ending that we still have many years until we see the answer to. But with Jason Momoa, there was a certain fun injected back in that has kept me excited for its sequel. However, throughout even the best of the movies in this franchise, there were some questionable decisions made by the actors when choreographing a fight. To be fair, the filmmakers have taken steps to feature people who don't care about what I'm about to get into, but it's still their brightest day after you realize it. There is a moment in Seven where as The Rock and Jason Statham fight, there's a really cool shot of one of them tackling the other through a table. Then not a minute later, the other gets a twisting shot of him smashing the first into another table to show how even the playing field is. It was weird that they would use the same kind of move twice in the same scene, but at first, I didn't think much of it. Who knows when it really started, but it was publicly revealed around 2019 that for a lot of the actors who starred in these movies, their contracts had a clause in it that they would give as much as they got, and it went so much deeper than that. They had someone counting everyone's punches in the choreography, and if they didn't have an equal number to their counterparts, a rewrite was in order. It kind of clicked for me when I heard that, simply because every fight between these certain actors had to end in some kind of stalemate every time, and that starts to get noticeable after a while. But frankly, that's only the tip of the iceberg of why the Fast and Furious franchise has only been downhill after the 7th. Say what you want about 8 onward, but they just didn't grip me in the same way that the previous three had. The idea that everyone in this crew is part of a superhero team pulled into the fray because they're the only ones who can get the job done is ridiculous because they're all supposed to be regular people. Skilled, strong, talented, and durable, but still regular people. And after seeing some of them survive crashing their cars at highway speeds and throwing themselves down mountains more than a few times, it gets harder to suspend my disbelief every time. And that gets even more difficult when the filmmakers are forced to up the stakes and danger every go-around. But when we look back at that pin I left earlier and think about how all the characters are immortal, the stakes become non-existent. And that may still be prevalent for even my favorites in the franchise, but at least 5, 6, and 7 are fun. And for every new film, the writers have to find a way to give the crew back their peaceful lifestyle. Let's just say that after going in for one last job upwards of half a dozen times, that idea gets old quick because the franchise never had any longevity to begin with. And when people keep trying to make more and more of these movies, Vin Diesel, I'm looking at you, they only bury themselves deeper into the tropes and cliches that they were laughing at along with us a decade ago. But even if we put all of that aside for now and just look at the series in a vacuum, we can see exactly what worked and what didn't. One kind of works, three Tokyo Drift is still fun, and five, six, and seven are all timers. They work because there was something at the core of those movies that brought people into the theater. Something that grips you and makes you need to see it. One had a simple point break story, but for the time it worked. Tokyo Drift is just a sports movie, five is a heist, six is a comic book, and seven is a tribute to Paul Walker. Each of them has something. After that, the filmmakers tried to do that very same thing, but it has been seen with diminishing returns every time. 
I don't believe for a second that the two sequels to Fast X will end the franchise, but even with a confirmed endpoint, that wouldn't be enough to draw my interest back into the franchise. I don't care about the characters, the ever-expanding roster of Familia, or the massive action set pieces because in the past 10 years, none of the filmmakers behind these movies have made any decisions that get me invested. And I haven't even mentioned the terrible Hobbs and Shaw spin-off that also tried to create its own line of films. But maybe that's another video essay for another day. But despite my disillusionment with the current crop of Fast and Furious movies, thinking about every stupid mistake the actors and filmmakers have made, I'll still be there buying a ticket to the next one. Mainly just because I want to see Jason Momoa chew up some more scenery. But what do you think? Love the Fast and Furious movies? Never seen one of them and I just spoiled the whole series for you? Let me know down in the comments. And as always, thanks for watching. Make sure to leave a like, subscribe for weekly video essays and reviews, and enjoy a delicious sandwich.